Welcome back to Ether Hour, everybody. I am your host, Conrad Franz, joined as always by Dimitri Kalyagin. It's been two weeks since our last episode where we discussed Givi, Motorola, Strelkov, the early days of the Donbass War. Be sure to check that one out. We've gotten a lot of great feedback on that one, as well as the clip that we made out of it that accompanies it on YouTube that has some great footage from those days going over our voiceover. So be sure to check all of that out. But we're back with another, a bit almost more of a return to form here. We're going to talk about some of our favorite pieces of Orthodox tradition, iconography, some of the oldest famous images that our church tradition holds to, as well as some other uh, relic talk and other interesting discussion of some holy images and items in our tradition. Dimitri, how are you doing? Doing well, Conrad. And, you know, this subject matter is, of course, some, some of the most important, you know, one of the most important elements of the Orthodox faith and the Orthodox tradition generally that we can speak of, just because it kind of defines the imagery and the images we see, not just across history, but also, you know, Christian history, European history, but also what we see currently in the political sphere. We see Putin, of course, handing out icons of the image of Christ to some soldiers on the Kherson front in 2023. We see uh, images of icons, of course, appear in the Kiev Pechersk Lavra protests during the, of course, uh, occupation by the Ukrainian government. We see icons and Orthodox imagery appear all over the place during processions at, at, at anti-abortion rallies in the United States and Canada and other places around the world. Orthodox icons, uh, of course, are one of the most important aspects of Western European as well as Eastern European culture. And it's just, I think, very important to kind of underline some of the most notable examples of these and kind of ex express how they, you know, define the, the tradition of Europe, at least in terms of making images of holy things, images of Christ himself, images of the saints, and exactly how they, you know, affect not just the political sphere, but also everyday social life. There's also another aspect of simply uh, taking into account the supernatural aspect of these icons, not just the images themselves, but also some of the miracles associated with them, which, uh, you know, people might say, well, supernatural, surely that's not realistic to speak of in a but it definitely is and just the amount of historical accounts related to these particular images and some of the relics as well related to iconography and relic veneration in the church uh, these are all all encompassing subjects which you know just we just have to touch upon and so we will dedicate a few episodes towards these and this will be uh, the first of many yeah much like our uncanonized saints episodes you can kind of envision this as the first of what will be, kind of, well, you know, when we'll kind of establish the groundwork of the of the subject matter here with, you know, what we're about to get into, the Mandilion and the image not made by hands of Edessa and some other things. And then we'll, as we learn more and read more and kind of relate things more to current day orthodoxy, we'll come out with some, some part twos, part threes, perhaps, just like we did with that previous series. But one of the first things we want to move into, actually, before I do that, I want to just say as well that this isn't going to be a super polemical episode per se. We may be offering our perspective on why icons are legitimate and everything like that if it comes up. But just from the broadest perspective, when as someone who was raised Protestant, the the presence and the the proliferation of icons was something that, of course, you struggle with as someone who comes from an iconoclastic tradition. But ultimately, when I when you, when you recognize what orthodoxy isn't just you know having the correct opinions and all these other things. It's the difference is that it is this kind of all-encompassing lifestyle. It's kind of the Christian culture, the Christian civilization that you get brought into when you become Orthodox. You kind of become, I guess I could say, civilizationally Christian. And part of that is recognizing, you know, these kind of propensities and this desire of man to to portray things and to look upon, you know, the images of others and of, of God's creation of the image of God in the face of humanity. I just remember hearing somebody explain that, look, how many people do you know that have sports stars all over their wall, celebrities, movie posters, everything. But, so, and that's fine, especially in, you know, a Protestant culture, but suddenly you put an image of Jesus or the saints and now you're an idolater. Now you're, it's like, hold on. It's not idolatry to put up, you know, Michael Jordan or, you know, whoever it is we put on the wall, but it is when we put up, you know, someone we consider to be the Lord and Savior of all. So once you start to think of it like that and realize that iconography, the relics of saints, Orthodox music, incense, these kinds of things that some might consider extra, I guess, for lack of a better term, within Christianity, you know, it's actually just about humanity embracing Christ fully, living the full human experience, the full 
incarnate life with all of your senses, your eyes looking on images, your senses smelling the incense, you know, all these kinds of things, your taste, even when you, of course, commune. These are, this is how the full Christian life is lived as a fully incarnated human, just as Christ was fully incarnate and human on this earth and experienced what we experience. So this is, uh, this is why this is so important is not just, you know, images that are pretty and cool miracle stories. It's about bringing yourself fully into a life in Christ. But with all of that, I want to talk about what I think is one of my favorite stories from Holy Tradition, unless you have anything to say about that subject, Dimitri. I just, just wanted to mention, it seems to be, at least in world history, since the since the time of Christ and the Apostles, three kind of interrelating traditions of iconoclasm, or shall we say iconographic atheism, where one of them, of course, emerges out of rabbinical Judaism, possibly around the time of the publication of the Talmud, which is uh, the proliferation of the idea amongst the Jews, or you know those who had, did not follow Christ and the Apostles, but in fact apostatized and have you know follow what we call today as orthodox judaism you know the heavily edited version of what we see in the old testament there is that jewish tradition of not depicting god as well as not depicting the angels or any iconography of any sort in their synagogues and you know places of worship as well as in the home so that is one tradition the second tradition of course is probably the more famous one today it's the islamic tradition of not depicting allah muhammad and some of the other characters of is the islamic tradition in fact it was very controversial in islam even to depict uh, even human beings. So when photog photographs came out in the Russian Empire, it was a big discussion amongst the Islamic Tatars. Well, could they depict the Ottoman Caliph, so the leader of Islam at the time? Because Islam does not have patriarchs or a pope, but it does have a uh, semi-religious, a synthesis between a religious and a political uh, figure called the Caliph, who is the leader, the leader of the Islamic Caliphate. And at the time, it was the Ottoman Sultan. And when people were taking, you know, photographs became available in the 1800s, p people took photographs of the Sultan, and a lot of Tatars in Russia were, of course, uh, we thought, well, could we actually have a photograph of the Caliph on the wall? And it was a big discourse. It took about a few years for them to decide. In the end, they said, yes, we're allowed to have... So they had, you know, images of the Russian emperor, and then they would have an image, a photograph of the caliph in various uh, places like town halls and what today is known as Tatarstan in Russia and places of Islamic sort of uh, prevalence in the Russian Empire. But a very interesting tradition there as well in Islam, which appears as well in the 1600s. But there's also the Christian tradition of iconoclasm, which, like Conrad said, does not begin with what we, what we know today as Protestantism, where, um, you know, from, from which uh, Conrad's family same came from. And a lot of Americans, actually, the founding fathers, a lot of them were Protestants. And even, you know, those in Western Europe, of course, the Protestant tradition is heavily prevalent there. But it, it actually comes, it's a much much more ancient tradition. It comes from the iconoclastic period in the Byzantine, in, 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 you know, in, in the Byzantine Empire, which, frankly, is very curious because it almost coincides with the creation of Islam, at least in the 1600s, but also it... It's not really explained how, why exactly icons began to be, you know, destroyed. There is as many versions of exactly why the Byzantines and the Romans, the Orthodox Greeks and the Orthodox Romans began apostatizing in this way and began destroying icons. But um, it is a very curious kind of development. And so we'll discuss some of the great icons which have actually survived through that iconoclastic period. You know, the one on Mount Sinai, for example, and many others. But there is this, uh, there, are, there are at least three branches uh, the other religions in the world, notice all the various pagan traditions, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, all the various pagan traditions of Africa, Southeast Asia, Australia, and even the Eskimo traditions of various countries like Canada and Siberia, all of them allow for images. So it seems that there are only three traditions in world religions that, in fact, go against the depiction of holy supernatural beings, and as well as things related to sacredness and the divine, which is these three. And I think that's also important to note just before we begin. But the Orthodox tradition, as well as some of the other variances and schisms, for example, the Roman Catholics, we, of course, do pertain that uh, images of the divine are, are possible, especially in the incarnation of Christ and, you know, depicting the Holy Spirit as a dove, things of this nature, angels, the saints. So, and Conrad, I think you had a great example you wanted to bring up from one of the earliest icons, at least in uh, the New Testament history. Arguably the earliest icon, the image not made by hands, the image of Edessa, which is an image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that was obtained by King Abgar of Edessa, which is a Syrian city that is part of a 
kingdom that no longer exists, hasn't existed in a long time. And this story passed down through tradition involves this... Hey everybody, Conrad here. Hope you enjoyed that free preview. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. You can use the free trial as well as, you know, support us for $7 a month at the link down in the description. Uh, it really helps us out. You'll get the full backlog of Ether Hour episodes, and it just supports us for all the content that we make here. We discuss the Mandelian, the Shroud of Turin, the history of icons and warfare, and some other things in this episode, so don't miss it. It's a really great discussion. And for those of you that already support, we really appreciate it. We're coming at you with a lot more content, free and paid, very soon. So, again, your support means a lot to us. Consider it worldwarnow.substack.com. If you're on YouTube, it's the link below. If you're already listening on Substack, you know there should be an easy prompt to support us for going premium. So thank you so much again, and God bless. Yeah.